was intact on the third row. <laughs> <laughs> the third row was you can find it out at all. Um, okay, so I'll, I think it's important that, that we get to ask questions. We have to ask questions all the time. But, but first, uh, I'd like to, to get kind of, is there anyone who wants to make comments on, on what has been, what, what you have learned here for the past few days, and basically what your thoughts are, what you think their major problems, what you think their major promises. So the comment is that there's already a rich uh, environment of middleware. You're saying um, not on GPUs, existing middleware that scientists use, and how are we going to en enable that on, for GP GPU computing? Um, are, are you talking about that runs on GPUs already? Yeah. The, the no, you're talking about stuff that that like the University of Maryland? level interfaces. Like yeah. your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys going to support, do you want third party support? What's the model at NVIDIA? We, we definitely want to encourage middleware. Uh, we want an ecosystem on top of GPU computing. So, um, I mean, we're doing things like exposing our in, uh, instruction set so that people can write language tools. They can write their own compilers. Um, you know, we support middleware developers. There's no reason for us not to. So, and, and research projects as well as uh, commercial projects. I, I'm not sure if that addresses your no, concern. Me, so, so, I mean, the other part of your question, I think, was, was how can all of the people who are developing middleware coordinate and not reinvent the wheel over and over and over again? Like, is there something? And I think that's, that is an important question for the community. Um, there's two real watering holes in, in the GPU community, in GPU computing community right now. One is gpgpu.org, which is a website that was started by Mark um, years ago before, you know, before he was at NVIDIA. Five years next week, um, and and that's uh, that's a vibrant community. Lots of people go there. That's a great place. There's, there's very active forums, and there's also a, a news section where you could announce if there's you could send Mark mail basically and say you know here's here I've just started this website that's or this open source project on middleware X or Grape GPU or whatever it is. Um, the uh, the other place is the official CUDA developer forums, which are hosted by Nvidia. Uh, and are obviously a little narrower because they focus on NVIDIA technology, whereas gpgpu.org includes, includes everything. Uh, and again, has a vibrant community of people exchanging thoughts and, and, and lessons on, on, uh, on, on their experiences and so forth. So those are good places. If nothing else, those are good places to sort of recruit and announce. And, and I can imagine that, that then the sub-communities, you know, a group of people who really want to develop a particular domain-specific tool you know, that would be a good place to sort of recruit and announce and periodically update folks, and then you might end up starting your own forum, your own open, you know, source words project and so forth. Uh, yeah. So there's a statement uh, that perhaps there's not a middleware solution above the domain areas is a paraphrase of, of what Peter just said. What we were trying to do at Maryland is look at, at the algorithm level rather than the domain level and, and think of specific algorithms and we look to the list of the 10 greatest you know, algorithms of the last century or something and we're trying to pick those off one by one and not make a one-size-fits-all instantiation of, of FMM or, or FFT convolution type things, but provide some middleware that shows how you would implement those things um, in your domain. I think what's needed is more coordination at this level. If, as the ecosystem grows, we can meet and recruit and do those things, but there's right now not a strong NVIDIA-driven coordination of people who are trying to produce those things. I, I see from my side. Maybe there is, and we're just learning, because I've learned a lot at this meeting about what NVIDIA actually has. No, there's not. We're struggling to keep up with it, I think is the short answer, and, and we should do the better job. Yes, Maria.
It's not something you've used. And so one of the goals in CUDA, besides having a rich set of tools that work for speech already, is that you all know it. And um, one of the things I read on the web is just one of the websites talking about the, uh, the new R670 coming out of ATI, AMD, was that it will be Brook. So do you want to go learn Brook? I, I don't know if that's really true. It's not out yet, so we can't see if it's true or false yet. We just have to wait and see what they have. Um, and the other thing is that we have published our um, PTEX assembly language for language developers so that, and, uh, you know, I know there's interest from Microsoft to get C Sharp working, multi-threaded C Sharp. We don't, we would love that. We would, you know, as, as much as you guys don't use C Sharp, there's a lot of people in the world who do use C Sharp, and if they could just run it on a GPU, you know, what if, what if uh, Photoshop just starts, uh, Photoshop's not in C Sharp, but mm -hmm. uh, Excel. I've used Excel spreadsheets that are incredibly slow. So they could stand to have some performance improvement, run in C Sharp, C Sharp runs on GPUs. We've published our specification so that language developers can target our machines. So, so the comment was, uh, you know, computer technology is evolving so fast, and, and as users of computer technology, the, what's really important is to see a consistent path, have some, some way that you can continue to be productive and not be continuously retooling. Um, so I, I would argue, I, I agree, totally. Um, I actually think that that motivates one of the design decisions in CUDA, which was to try to build for this scalable, build something which will scale with future, as future architectures get not, not faster in clock rate, but wider in parallel uh, capability. And, and so this, this, the one, there, one retooling is inevitable, and, and many of you have already started it. Others, others you know, not just here, but just in general, are, are going to, to have to do it, and that's to retool your algorithms to, to, to uh, take advantage of fine-grained parallelism because that's the only opportunity for speed up on a single chip from now on to the first order. Uh, and I talked about that a little bit through my, my, my opening motivational speech, is that you know, Moore's Law has stopped meaning that, that computers go faster, it just means they get wider. And so that retooling, if, it's not already, if your algorithm doesn't already lend itself to that sort of uh, fine-grained you know, data parallel execution, like what, what happens in CUDA, then you will have to do that retooling once, no matter what, or else your code just won't get faster on a single node. On any machine. On any machine, oh, yeah. CPU, okay. GPU, anything. Uh, that's true. That's true for multi-core CPUs. It's true for CUDA. Um, so, so that's that's in some ways the bad news. The good news is um, we think we've done a good job in designing CUDA and in the sort of hardware architecture that underlies it. You know, that's exposed by PTEX. You know, that could and that could you know conceivably be targeted by other languages. Is being targeted by other languages. So we think we've done a pretty good job in something that will scale for going forward. So. Maybe maybe there is a retooling necessary. Maybe it's only one retooling for a while, and not not a not a continuous. Certainly, you won't have to be continually retweaking your CUDA code, you know, constantly. You know, Mark mentioned a few things that you know G80 has some things that will you know the warp size might change a little bit. You know, there there, there are there are there are things that could could change. You know, the amount of shared memory could change. You know, there are, there are architectural parameters, and so in general, strategies like auto tuning and um, writing auto-tuning code, writing templated parameterized code that doesn't you know, hard code the limit any more than you would hard code the size of the L1 cache in your C code. Uh, that's a good idea. That's always a good idea. But, but CUDA going forward, you know, we'll, we'll support. So,
tricks or something which people should learn how to do this efficiently. I don't know even the simple things like enrolling robots and so on. So we will spend basically time learning this while there's some expert like he is his daddy's business he dedicates a special amount of time and maybe better expert than any of that. So why not uh, just repeat this experience once to use it. So and in this case if it can be wrapped by some kind of middle wear layer and so uh, this kind of separate actually people who are working on <coughs> scientific level who actually want to solve, I don't know, this uh, astrophysics problems, not going to very details of that, but so for them it should be like that. So if I can kind of summarize the general feeling, we would stack if I can kind of summarize the general uh, idea we're trying to get, we, we could live with the factor of two lower performance if that would give us some reasonable uh, development time so we don't need to worry about low-level things like number of registers, bank conflicts, this and that, and so on. We can, we can understand how to parallelize our things into thousands of threads, but these kind of hardware level, very low hardware level, level issues are definitely beyond the comprehension of, of most of us. Yeah. You, you so, understand, but you don't want to deal with right. That. Even even if there's a certain performance disadvantage, um, we could kind of take that if development will be will be uh, easier. I just want to make a quick comment. So I started computing in the days of vector supercomputers, and I learned as a student on my own how to vectorize a code, and that was fine. And then I had to retool, rewrite my codes to be parallel, and I saw how that broke out, and I think that was the advent of M MPI and to a lesser extent PVM that made it possible to sort of write generic parallel computer code that would run on any vendor. And what I'm excited about, I think CUDA is in the right direction, and I think there's, there's somebody is going to come up with finally something the equivalent of MPI that makes generally heterogeneous, multi-core, Some of what we're seeing here is necessary to get one of the elements of a multi-core heterogeneous computer to work, which is a GPU, and you'll always have to know how to make that element work well. But there's another problem to be solved, which is how do I use several of these and, and maybe different architectures with one code, and that's where the middleware really makes, makes the difference. But it's, what is it? I think it's something at the level of MPI, which is not domain specific. It deals with the, the, the aspects of programming for this architecture that are generic. So, so at a time that, oh, it's no big deal if the number of shared memory or warp thing changes, you, know, you don't have to optimize for that. And sometimes I understand what you're saying that, but I think it's also important that you realize that we're going to choose an algorithm, and that's the most important step. And if we have more memory, more warp, that affects what algorithm we choose in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so in some sense, uh, somewhat minor incremental changes in hardware can have big changes in the code we write. So it, it is but no, so I'll, I'll, let me try to respond. I was the one who said that, so let me try to respond. So the comment uh, for the tape was, uh, was, you know, that I commented earlier, oh, you know, if the, if the shared memory changes, you know, size changes or the warp size changes, then, then that's, uh, that may seem like no big deal, but, but to us, Eric commented, uh, it, is, it is a big deal because it might affect the algorithms we pick. And actually, I, that's, that's sort of, that's, that's the point I was trying to make in the other direction was that, your, your basic algorithm is this distribution across thousands of threads, this execution model where you break them up into blocks of some size that that um, that will that can intercommunicate, and other and outside of that they don't intercommunicate. That and, and you stream through them. That is what shapes the algorithm. The the algorithm at the nuts and bolts details of of you know that Mark presented in his sort of you know fine tuning optimization strategy. That, that actually shouldn't be affected. That's, that's, in, the, that's in the, you know, power, the power of two or less sort of category that Mario talked about for most algorithms, that, that little fine-grained tuning. But I think that maybe if you're talking about, you know, linear algebra type problems, it really is fine-grained, that, that's exactly right. But for kind of complex scientific codes where we're lucky to, to be able to put 32 things in, in 8K of memory, and, and you're saying, oh, we should have 200, Know, we're going to work really hard to work within that limitation, and it is restricting our choice of algorithms. Okay, so Eric's comment was that in scientific codes, the uh, uh, you know they're lucky if they can these complex algorithms are sometimes lucky if they can fit 32 things in 8K, and so so I'm being too cavalier with how how hard they will have to work to tool and to fit that restriction. Yeah. That's true. Um, <laughs> the, the, I mean, the constraints there are constraints that you have to work with in, when you design your algorithms, and um, 
what I was going to say in comment to Mario's comment that they were willing to spend a factor of two, once you make that decision and you find an algorithm that fits, I mean, some of those optimizations that I showed are just a factor of two, and you might not want to worry about them. And that way you don't have to spend that effort. And also, once you pick it, um, an algorithm, we're not going to change the hardware in a way that causes it to go slower, um, most likely. I mean, every once in a while there's some weird that's, corner case. That's called a regression. Yeah, that's and, called and a regression, that, and we that avoid is, those. It's a very bad thing to happen. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you're, <laughs> things, the limits are going to go higher, the number are going to go lower, and the cliffs are going to get smaller. Like all that stuff I talked about about coalescing, it's going to get easier on future chips and things like that. So, um, but, uh, I mean, at the high level, your algorithm is not going to change that much. It might do things like, for example, um, for smaller pro pro uh, problem sizes in n-body, Lars, you know, applied um, multiple threads to each body instead of just doing one thread per body. And there's decisions like that. And yeah, those are algorithmic decisions that you have to make. Um, So George, George's comment is about the, uh, the GPGPU conference in Boston that just happened recently where Winmei, who was the keynote speaker, and he talked about their work on auto-tuning, and he showed some graphs of how, the, uh, how they, would, they would try out many different parameters, varying things like number of threads, amount of shared memory, you know, and so forth, and, yeah. and sort of automatically sweep for looking for the sweet spot for the, for the hardware, and that sometimes the sweet spot was counterintuitive. Basically, you know, architectures these days, I don't think it's just GPU architectures, are high dimensional. They're, they're, they're complex machines. And, and it, this is actually increasingly true in, in, every, in all architectures. So this sort of auto-tuning middleware is one of the things that I think Mark and, and, and we, we, would, we would advocate. By all means, build, you know, LRFFT is like FDW in the sense that it's sort of, it, it's based on auto-tuning experiments. You build plans and so forth. That, that's increasingly the right approach to building, to building uh, code is to write uh, low-level libraries or you know, medium-level libraries that, that contain the computational primitives you care about, and then, you know, turn that loose, turn a genetic program loose to optimize that, or, or have, you know, have, you know, uh, you know, sweep it, you know, build it to be auto-tuning, and then you can build your high-level algorithms on top of that without having to worry about it, which I think but, the talks to Eric's point as well. Yeah, yeah. on another, on, on the other hand, though, I mean, you're right, maybe that, it needs to be like a middleware thing because scientists don't want to be having to write genetic algorithms to make their code run fast. They, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the common problems in many fields, and Georgia Astrophysics is, is an example, uh, is the need to deal with multi scale problems. Mm -hmm. And it's very nice if the, some of that, that effort could be done in a more systematic way and led by NVIDIA. Uh, I, I don't know what to say. I'm not sure I've seen you somewhere. Let me. There are, let me. Go ahead, let me okay. I think the comment to summarize was that uh, many problems today in theoretical astrophysics and elsewhere are explicitly multi-scale problems with very large disparate space and time scales. And it would be nice for an a company like NVIDIA to take the lead in showing how this new technology can address that set of problems. So I think that that's exactly right, and you guys should, should think about it, because uh, so I'm the director of a center for multi-scale physics. and. Uh, this is exactly the problem that led me to think about GPUs. Is, and it's the next step, really. When you link together lots of GPUs, if you can encapsulate the problem so that some of the scales are on the GPUs and some of the scales are in the CPUs, and, the, and you can break apart the algorithm so that things can be done efficiently without much communication, you know, minimizing communication, you have a real opportunity, and you guys can lead that. So why, why should, I mean, yeah. not, to be, not to be difficult, but why should we be leading it as opposed to you? I mean, you're the director of the <laughs> multi-scale physics. <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. No, no, no. There are, some, there are some aspects of this which will come up in, in the hardware can accelerate it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think our community, we think about these problems. We think about the algorithms. How are we going to solve these problems? Mm -hmm. 
and you know, naturally we'll come up with a favorite vendor. For years it was Cray, and then it became you know some other company. And I, what I'm saying is, if if you think of this as an area, it's very generic across math yeah, yeah. and physics right now. If you think of this as an area of something that you're excited by, maybe that changes uh, some of the decisions you make about priorities. And I think it captures a lot of our interest. That's yeah. The, yeah. Well, we're we're you know especially as you can sort of list. Like right, right now it's so vague I don't quite know what to say. Like yeah. is this is this you know. Which kinds of features would help this along? I think right. we need your guidance and yeah. you, you right. the, the community's guidance on, in this uh, in this topic. Yeah, just like trying to understand or elaborate maybe to ask what you said. That's what can be done because of small multi-scale problems. Maybe it has less particular ratios of the I don't know shared memory to <coughs> size of the whatever number of threads and so on. So there may be kind of uh, data structures which are typical for that. So maybe if there, there will be support already on the level which can be like making them more specialized, I don't know. Or, or yeah, I think what happens is I think that the in six months or a year, I can't predict the time scale, the meetings will have a lot more flow of information going the other way. Back to you. Now we've tried these things, and boy, it would be helpful for this class of problems, not just my particular in-body code that I'm working on today, but this class of problems could benefit from a a different direction and be ready for that. That's what I think. Yeah, do. absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, uh, I'd like to start slowly moving towards towards kind of more um, speculative discussion about the future. Just, but first, uh, so what, what time did your uh, what time did your car leave for for the airport? <laughs> or, and and what, what time is your flight? Oh. In the evening? I have to take the flight to the airport at okay. 12:30. So I have to. So and that. okay, what time do we get double precision? <laughs> <laughs> Can, can you definitely after the airport. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you say anything about uh, your plans for for the next couple of years? So how do you how do you see the GPUs developing? Uh, do you see mergers of GPUs with CPUs because these are not computation machines, and you naturally want them close to the CPU? Um, just can you comment on that? Okay. Um, so so the uh, one of the questions is about mergers of, of GPUs and CPUs and. Um, Actually, David Kirk gave a talk at Graphics Hardware recently, where it was actually a panel uh, where he addressed this, this question. And so, um, uh, to us, that's sort of an engineering decision. You do it when the time makes sense, and it's driven by when you uh, by when 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 it makes more when the benefit of having you know GPU like you know fabric and CPU like fabric on the same die, which that benefit is, is, is exactly bandwidth, outweighs the cost, which is that right now GPUs and CPUs are both big. They both fill the die. So today you can put a mid-range or even maybe low-end CPU and a mid-range or low-end GPU on the same die, um, but would anybody buy that? Is that a useful thing? Or would you rather have you know, a high-end GPU and a high-end CPU? So but do you see a program, the programming model changing dramatically if, if, if and when that happens? Oh, that's a good question. So does the programming model model change? Um, I, it's interesting. I mean, that's one way it could it could change. Another possibility is simply for GPUs to get more flexible and to get better at running uh, the kind of code which today people think, oh, that's CPU code. That's actually already happening. There's a lot of conventional wisdom about what doesn't run on a CPU or, or doesn't run on a GPU that is, is sort of demonstrably false. Uh, and uh, just yesterday, somebody sent out mails saying, hey, you know, a customer said, I heard sorts don't work well on GPUs. And so you can point and say, well, here's the, comp here's the TerraSort competition that was won by a GPU last year, pre-CUDA. And so, I mean, there's, so it is, po I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to thump my chest, I'm just saying, I think that uh, it's, it's possible that moving GPUs and CPUs on the same core is the same solution. It's possible that making GPUs more flexible and, and the CPU becomes a traffic cop, the thing that, you know, pulls the keyboard and, and um, tells, the GPU, you know, gives the GPU compute tasks, not just pure data parallel compute tasks is a possibility. Uh, it's not, uh, you, you know, one company or another can sort of pick a, pick a direction and announce it and build a lot of hype around it, but um, I'm not actually sure what the right answer is, and I think, I think time <coughs> needs to tell. Right now, you really want a high-end, for high-end big, big problems, you really want to use the whole die. Yeah, We're not to the stage yet, right? Well, I mean, it just sense to throw away some of your compute resources. Yeah, let me just comment on what, what our worry is. That it's that if I write my, rewrite my code now to use CUDA, and it runs on, on the current generation of car as well. And then you guys decide to change something dramatically, like move the GPUs, integrate the GPUs and CPUs and completely change. I don't know how much uh, there's the, the bandwidth cost, how much uh, computation cost, and so on. So I'll have to do another series of rewrites 
to, to uh, use that new architecture efficiently in like a year or two from now. So how do I future-proof my code? Can I just make a quick comment? Yeah. We did the experiment 10 years ago, and commodity beats specialization. Cray vector processors were fantastic. It took us five or eight years, in my experience, to get back to where I could do the same calculation on a commodity Beowulf or SP2 that I could have done on a Cray, but I couldn't get a Cray anymore because they weren't available. They cost too much. And so I would say my answer is um, if another company or your company can make something on one chip that it remains exciting to something other than science, fine. But I become very nervous about a specialized product just for our small scientific community. I'm very excited about the idea of a commodity product which is going to stay on the market. And I think that aspect is something that you don't want to lose sight of. And I, I think we're, we're going to, I mean, our main business is graphics. And the reason you all get to enjoy the hardware is that there are a million 18-year-old boys who want to shoot each other. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're funding supercomputing these days. Bingo. That's right. Craig couldn't stay in business. MathPar couldn't stay in business. Right. You know, KSR. The list goes on and on with these, these one, you know, these guys who targeted supercomputing go out of business. We can't target supercomputing. Yeah. Maybe someday. So don't worry. Maybe. Right. Sorry, let's see that first. First of all, I uh, would like to thank you guys. Uh, you have put a very nice presentation in the last few days. I mean, I'm a, a presentation that uh, targets different different people. Okay? And that's from people who have never touched CUDA to people that have uh, some experience with it. And it gets uh, into the, everything. It's something for everybody. So it was a nice presentation. Very nice presentation. I like it very much. The question that uh, I think Mario wanted to do or is when you get double oh, yeah. I think for me, that's not as much important as the question is as how much do I need to tune the application when double precision gets there? I mean, we can write the application now for single precision and get a lot of optimization there. How much do we need to change later when double precision gets there? Well, um, so in C, you have um, float, and you have double, and then there are a couple of places where precision comes up. You have math library functions like sine and cosine and things like that, and then you have, you know, literals, which can be 1.0f or just 1.0, and that, that's the difference between a float and a double. So what we tell people is to make your code float safe, which means use, you know, float where you only need, or sorry, you only use double where you need it, which means if you only need a float precision sign, then use sign F instead of sign. If you only need, you know, 0 0.5 float, then do 0 0.5 F or some, you know, pi float instead of pi double. Um, so be careful there. But if you write code now um, that uses double, you know, declares double and calls sign instead of sign F, then when the chip gets here with double, it'll use double. <laughs> You know, the compiler already supports it. So um, if you write it now to support that, um, then you don't have any tuning to do. I, I, maybe. The data size and the uh, yeah, so, well, I mean, so the same thing applies there. So you know, the question is, what about data sizes and alignment? I mean, yeah, so I think that if you're... If your code is, if it coalesces an array of floats, then it should coalesce an array of doubles, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah that's so that, that's clear, but mm -hmm. uh, you have a uh, share, if you have field, the shared memory with floats. Yeah. Well, then you're not going to fit double. On the other hand, when we get a chip that has double, uh, well, I, don't, I can't say too much, yeah. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't. Like when? We can't say when, no. We can only say early next year, say early 2008. Okay, early 2008. Um, that's, yeah, that's pretty much all we can say, I think. Is there any chance on a new CUDA? I'm sorry? Any chance on a new CUDA? Oh, an open source CUDA? Open source? Uh, if, if they wanted to, if somebody wanted to, we... Yeah, I mean, you could implement uh, CUDA. We have the assembly language published, and it could be, you know, it could be compiled for 
uh, SSE or yeah the Are you guys sure that the only thing is the memory sure there's the the, the, the runtime know what's in the end user legal agreement I'm not sure we should the three of us not being lawyers should say yes yeah, we should go and do that I like when you download <laughs> CUDA you sign you click through right. when you download CUDA you click through some end user EULA end user license agreement yeah. I think I I haven't read it I'm not a lawyer if I read it, it wouldn't make any sense. So I don't want to quite be the person who stands in front of you on film and says, yes, <laughs> yes, you can go start an open source CUDA project. Uh, but I mean, strategically, you know, we're, we're, I, you know, we like the idea, we like CUDA. We would like it to become a standard, you know, a cross-platform standard. How that plays out, who does it and so forth, that's the question, you know, they didn't lawyers, they didn't marketing guys, they sent the technologists. Yeah, the, what's that one? Uh, what Okay, so that's, that's my job, is we try and figure repeat, out... Might as well repeat the question. Um, the, the question is, um, what little features can, what features can we sneak in on the die that will help the supercomputing community and, and not steal performance from the graphics community, which is where we, we really target. Or add cost to the graphics community. Well, we're, we're allowed to add cost. <laughs> um, well, as long as you we have, have the revenue. We're, 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 um, we're allocated a certain amount of the, the die size for supercomputing features. Load and store was one that came out on G80. Um, we have double precision is not for graphics. Shared memory is all for uh, the supercomputing. Yeah, pixels don't talk to each other. They don't use shared memory. They don't need to talk to each other. Um, and so that's, that's essentially my job. And this also gives me an opportunity to ask you, invite you guys, if you can give me a core computation that takes less than a millisecond of time that you think is a fundamental, shows off fundamental computational requirements for your kind of application, I will use it. I will pull it in and say, the whole astrophysics community needs to do, be able to do this kind of feature very well. A simple thing that Mark pointed out is transpose. How do you do transpose well? Well, we do transpose pretty well. It didn't take a lot. It took the shared memory to get transpose to work well. That helps all linear algebra people. <laughs> yep. You might as well put our, our, ours up there, too. Um, so I invite you, if you have a simple kernel that I can explain to managers in three sentences, you know, it, it can't be long. I can't say, well, it's a you know, partial differential equation solver that looks at these elliptical and linear girls, and they'll just go, blah, forget it. But, but if they can send you a kernel of code that you can put in your test right. suite. If you send me a CUDA code that I can put in a test suite, I will. I have to run under a millisecond, though. I think I should. Could there be much to gain by coming up with very specialized, or somewhat specialized, versions of the GPUs that dispense with some of the graphics stuff okay. you know, and have it replaced by sure. more of the silicon for computational? Okay. I have the idea that the market is may rapidly increase the market for high performance. Yeah. Okay, so Ar Ar Archie, right? I, what's your name? Alden. Alden, I'm sorry. Somehow I saw it. somebody else got confused. Um, uh, the, uh, so the question was, um, would it make sense to uh, make specialized versions of the chip that maybe lose some of the graphics things and add more CUDA goodness um, or, 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 or specialized things for, uh, for high-performance computing? Um, so economically, uh, let, me, let me give a long-term strategic answer first, which is eventually, yes. Like what we are in the process of doing with CUDA is opening up entire new markets I talked a little bit about this. HPC is a big market. I mean, it's not it's not vanishingly small, despite you know Bill's comments about craze you know going off you know and so forth. It is it is a big market. It is a lot of money for us to be gained there. We're very excited about it. We're also excited about and I mentioned I just alluded to this at the very beginning uh, yesterday was that we're excited about uh, applications that hit consumers that are compute oriented. There are even applications in graphics that are compute oriented, like uh, video game physics. Physics is a big deal in video games these days. They want realistic 
monsters tumbling down stairs when you kill them and stuff, um, and buildings breaking through as you drive through a tank, uh, drive through a building with a tank. So there are, there are, there are consumer-facing applications that do have broad reach and huge economies of scale for compute. But as Lars said, we are very interested in opening up the true HPC markets as well, and, and, and we've done that with CUDA. We're going in further in that direction. Now, the short-term economic answer is that there is not much – Lars does exactly what you described. He, he, he adds features to chips that uh, will help supercomputing, and he has a budget for that. Uh, the economies of, of semiconductor manufacturing are such that uh, if you want to add a feature to a G80 that costs us a dollar, uh, and then we uh, and then we, we sell 70 million G80s, then 70 million dollars has to have come from somewhere to, uh, to pay for that. So we so so I mean it's it's not uh, it's not free. You you have to make many many chips for them to be at all reasonably priced. Um, this alludes, the, the great the great com uh, talk yesterday alluded to this right. Um, uh, you know, the, so, so it's, it's not easy. We do some of it already. We sort of have a budget for that. Uh, in, uh, do we, we also are starting to build, uh, you know, higher level products, boards. The Tesla series doesn't have graphics connectors out the back. And, you know, gradually we will differentiate that brand and include more and more high performance uh, computing services. So. It'll all get better. <laughs> well, let's, let's repeat the question. I guess, so the question is, there are some critical resources on the chip, number of threads, size of the shared memory, num number of registers, um, and even the number of multiprocessors. And the question is, wh what's going to change and how will it change? And uh, the pessimistic answer is, if it changes at all, all of your code has to be able to tune to it, which so in one sense, it could be bad to change any of it. But, but anybody could uh, any one of you would like to have one parameter change. Somebody wants more registers, he wants more shared memory, he wants more threads. And so we, uh, they will change, and I recommend you parameterize your code mm -hmm. so that you can adapt to these kinds of changes. These are known resources. They're not going to go away. They're going to get bigger. They're going to, you know, relationships are going to change, and you may want to be able to change your code. Yeah, Red numbers of registers is a big limit because it tells you how many threads you need, and that means you're not using as many processes. So this is mm -hmm. for example. But mm -hmm. you know, then there are other others of us like the N body where we just want more threads. Mm -hmm. so more concurrent threads. That's right. Yeah. So we never sell a, we never come out with a new chip that's slower. <laughs> <laughs> that's the high level answer. All these things will get better. All the performance cliffs will get softer. You know, that's that is that is that is our goal. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we tried that once and it didn't <laughs> make you think. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about that. So the question is, how, what, what is the direction that the video game and visual industries are pushing us? So we've sort of declared just now that at least at the moment those are our main markets, and so they're sort of driving the chip, and everybody else is along for the ride. Uh, that overstates it a little bit, but it's, but it's that's sort of what you're getting at. How do, how do those industries change? Sir, where we are now. What? Got us where we are now. Well, yeah, but what's going forward? I think is this question. What, what's going to change? Uh, where, where are they pushing us? Um, Everybody loves programmability, okay? So you will see more and more programmability. DirectX 10 uh, recently was this sort of recent new shift where they got rid of lots of fixed function pieces of the graphics pipeline and just replaced it all with much more programmable substrates. That kind of thing will, will, will increase. Um, everybody wants, you know, there's, there's no sign of a number of pixels and polygons that need to be transformed will continue to increase. And so there's no, there's no economic sort of end in sight to the sort of exponential curve that we will attempt to follow in terms of like what's driving performance. Uh, that said, people are probably willing to trade a little bit of that performance for increased programmability and, and more general purpose programmability. And so 
there are certainly um, you know, driving factors toward, toward exposing some of the things that we do in CUDA right now, but you can't do in graphics. There's, there's, some, there's a drive to, to expose some of those things in graphics. Um, yeah, and I would say that Oh, you turn back on. Um, so you've seen it. We've seen a trend. Uh, games got us going more programmable in terms of programmable stages in the pipeline. Um, but there's a there's a kind of research trend lately that I think that's going to probably pan out in the next couple of years towards what people are calling programmable graphics versus programmable shading. And so it's like Dave said a minute ago. There are many applications of this CUDA style, you know, data parallel computation with applications to computer graphics. So the ability um, to not just program a shader that runs in parallel on each pixel, but to have um, the GPU compute dynamic data structures and do things like um, massive you know, physics simulation um, and things like that. So it's not just going to be graphics and shading, but um, real, you know, I, I guess, complex computation for graphics and not just limited to this linear pipeline uh, through the GPU. And I would say another thing that, that is always interesting to them and to us in this room is uh, bandwidth. People want higher resolution monitors. You want that game. You don't want to anti-alias away all those. People claim that with our new anti-aliasing, they could see the enemy. You know, he's, he takes up one sixteenth of a pixel, but they can see him now. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, people want more pixels. They, they'd rather have sharpness from pixels rather than better anti-aliasing. Um, video is a huge application, right? People want, want to play HD movies. And I, I don't really know why. I'm getting too old to understand why you would want to play four HD movies at once. <laughs> but that's the kind of demand we're getting is that you want to stream, <laughs> you know, you want to stream HD movies to four HD monitors at once on one machine. So anyway, bandwidth, I think, is a big thing that's being pushed by everybody. It's always a, li a limit. We'll have, to, we'll have to wrap up, unfortunately. So one last thing. Uh, do you expect to, to maintain this uh, performance margin you have over CPUs for the foreseeable future? <laughs> we're running as fast as we can. <laughs> we're, um, we're building machines that, you know, we always have these goals of 2x or 4x, some, you know, 6 months, 12 months. Um, we as always, are you, we overcome them every every generation. We overcome them. We, I mean, there's always issues. Um, the die, the die are huge. They're 22 millimeters, 21 millimeters square. Um, we are at a wafer limit with our current chip manufacturer. If we have bigger die, we get fewer chips. So adding stuff means fewer. There's only so many wafers they can produce a year. We're at that limit. What are we going to do? If we make bigger chips, our market gets smaller. So, but there are limits, and we're trying to overcome them. There are other silicon manufacturers. We can, we're exploring all those routes. We're all, you know, there, one thing that's really nice about working at NVIDIA is it seems like there's somebody for every job. Somebody's worry is, I need this many wafers a year. Where are we going to get them? And we go out and find these things. And we want to maintain this 2X. Every yeah. year, kind and, of, and speed. we set other goals too because we can't for the next chips we can't just get two x faster. We have to do two x faster in the same power. Yeah, example. we have to do. Yeah, we have um, to keep the power limits down. People which aren't going to keep beefing up their power supply. People don't like buying 800 watt power supplies, and I understand <laughs> why. Um, but also, we and we, you know, we have to do things better. We can't just be faster. We have to do things better as well. Yeah. On, on that note. Um,